This is the Flipping Junkie Podcast, Episode 5. Welcome to the Flipping Junkie Podcast. My name is Danny Johnson, former software developer turned house flipper, flipping hundreds of houses. Each week, we bring you interviews, strategies, stories, and motivation to help you get started flipping houses and on your way to becoming your own boss and achieving financial freedom. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's get to it. I'm glad to have my good friend Mike Hambright on the show. He's a real real estate entrepreneur. He, along with his wife Lindsay, have purchased hundreds of houses over the last few years. Mike's uh, mostly a rehabber, wholesaler, but he also owns single family rental portfolio. He also is a mentor and coach uh, that helps people get started flipping houses. And some of you might know Mike as the founder of FlipNerd.com. Uh, that's a website he created for real estate investors uh, to find and market wholesale deals, uh, build the vendor team, uh, build community with other investors, and a whole lot more. It's a really cool site. Uh, he and his wife got into flipping because they were were tired of not being in control of, of what happened and with their jobs and their income. Uh, so they got into real estate investing. In this episode, uh, we really take a lot of time to delve deep into how to determine repair cost for typical rehabs. Now, it's something that many of you out there are struggling with and definitely something I struggled with early on when I got started. Uh, you're going to get to hear some great rules of thumb for determining the most common repair cost, as well as learn what domino effect to avoid when doing repairs to a house. Uh, you're also going to hear how to determine just how far you should take a rehab and how to know the level of fixtures and finishes to use uh, for each rehab. As well as that, you're going to learn how to make a decent guesstimate for an unknown so that you can go ahead with your calculations and make an offer quickly. I've put together a great guide for repair estimate rules of thumb that you can download on the show notes page. Just go to flippingjunkie.com slash five. Flippingjunkie.com slash five. Five. That's the number five. All right, well, let's get on with the show. All right, hello, Mike. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, Danny. Happy to be here. Great, great. Hey, Mike, uh, I like to find out from people how they got started, and, and not only that, but why they got started. What got you interested in real estate and flipping houses? Yeah, that's uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, I guess everybody has an interesting story because there's not... Yeah, it's rare to meet somebody that like was a born real estate investor, right? Unless their parents did it and they found their way in there. And I know some people like that, but most like came from somewhere else, uh, all walks of life. But uh, so yeah, I, I literally, even though I've I've personally bought hundreds of houses uh, over the last seven years, um, and I now mentor and coach people that will buy you know seven hundred to seven eight hundred houses this year, each year. And growing rapidly, and uh, I'm involved in a number of other things. Literally, just seven and a half years ago, I I only bought one house in my life, and that was the house that my wife and I lived in. So, my experience is is fairly new, uh, relatively speaking. But um, so I guess we go back to 2008. So, as you know, the market was kind of crashing. Not too bad in Texas. I'm in the Dallas market, so not too bad here relative to other markets, but. Uh, that's when we got started, and um, we were pretty naive about it. We actually had no idea what was kind of happening in the market. We didn't really, uh, you know, we didn't like try to time the market or anything like that. And everybody thought we were crazy for getting in, but uh, the reality is, is it was probably one of the best times to get in in recent history um, because everybody was running away and competition was, you know, a lot smaller than it is now, and. Uh, um, it was, just, it was just a good time to get in as long as you had access to some capital and uh, could aggressively get after lead generation because a lot of the competition was gone. But, but let me take it back before that, though. So my wife and I were both in uh, corporate America, and um, I worked for a large you know, Fortune 500 uh, company that everybody would uh, know um, that uh, was doing really well there, kind of flying high. And uh, I uh, I worked directly for the uh, basically for the CEO, and um, I was kind of his outspoken right hand man, if you will. I had kind of an apprentice type position that was just really awesome. Uh, but then uh, you know, I never thought I would have to leave or anything like that because he was real early in his tenure and probably would be doing this for 10, 15 years, and and so the sky was kind of the limit for me. It was a really awesome opportunity. 
But then uh, out of kind of nowhere, he got fired and got it was kind of a weird situation. But uh, so then the problem is, is I'm his outspoken right hand man. <laughs> and now I have nobody shielding yeah. me and, you know, all those people that I uh, that maybe kind of rubbed the wrong way that uh, I was safe at one point. I wasn't anymore. So basically I was next. And so um, then I went to work for and that was a very large company, like a five, five billion dollar company at the time. Then I went to work for uh, a startup that was flying really high, and um, uh, we grew the company in about 18 months. We had grown it up to about a half billion dollars, so it was actually wow. pretty crazy. I mean, a lot of the growth happened before I even came on board, but it was just flying high, lots of acquisitions, and very much a startup mentality. And uh, and then they f- and then they filed for bankruptcy, uh, and I actually left just before that. I kind of knew what was coming, um, and so. Um, and at that point, my wife was, our son had just been born. Our, we only have one son, but our son was born at the time. He was uh, literally like two months old, three months old when I left my job there. So, And my wife, who had made more money than I did as a consultant, had left her job to have our son. So here I am, you know, kind of new father, fairly new husband. We'd only been married for a few years, sole breadwinner. And now I have now neither of us have a job. I don't have insurance. We have a newborn. We had moved to Washington D.C., but our home was in the Texas and Dallas area. None of our family was there, and it's just like holy cow! I gotta gotta do something here. And um, and so, long story short, that's kind of how I got into real estate investing. I knew enough to know that I really wanted to work for myself. And like I said, I had been at a large company, and and uh, that didn't work out. Not that everybody's situation is the same. And then I went to a a smaller company and just felt like I didn't have control over my destiny of where I was going and financial security for my family and all those things kind of setting in at once. And it was like, I can't trust anybody other than myself. And, uh, and, 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 and if I don't succeed, then it's my own fault or my own doing at least. And somebody else isn't determining that for me. So it was kind of like the stars were aligned to make something happen. And, You've probably heard a lot of people in uh, real estate investing that you know, a lot of you know really successful people in this industry, uh, and I, I, I'm, we weren't like sleeping in a car or anything like that. I don't want to say it was this hardship story because we had done well, we had some savings built up and things like that. But it was this situation where failure just simply was not an option that we could even consider. And you've probably heard stories like that before, where you know somebody got backed into a corner and then they made things happen. You know, and that's. That's kind of what we did. That's kind of how we got started. And for several years, we were buying 60 or 70 houses a year. And then, as you know, things start to get bolted on, like property management and coaching and other types of stuff that looks appealing or is appealing. And um, then that all those things start to take on, uh, kind of soak up your time, if you will. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what um, – did you know somebody that was in the business that got you interested in it? Or did you see like a late night infomercial or what was it that? Uh, no, was... you know, um, I guess when I was growing up, I, you know, I used to watch this old house. My, my dad was always pretty handy. Um, I worked at a kind of a home um, repair center, like a Home Depot type thing in the Midwest where I grew up for uh, several years and was just around a lot of people building things and things like that, which is funny now because even though I rehabbed, you know, at least a couple hundred houses and and wholesaled a bunch more and have a lot of rentals and stuff like that. I I don't you know, I don't do anything. I don't uh I don't touch any tools or anything. It's it's really feels odd to me when I go <laughs> I just did it yesterday. I was like, I'm looking for a screwdriver for something and it took a while to find one. So um but uh, I was just I guess I'd always had an interest in real estate investing and some of it was probably from early on like late night infomercials and I remember my stepfather had bought the uh, Carlton Sheets cassette tape, like the big uh, plastic package of cassette oh, tapes, yeah. you know. And <laughs> and to be honest, that thing sat like in a in in our basement for years. I don't even know if it was ever opened, but it kind of sat there for a long time. And so I guess that I'd always had an interest, uh, but had you know wasn't really exposed to it. Uh, but you know, it was either I didn't have the money for a long time, and then it was like you know maybe I could find the money, but I don't have the time to do it, and then. It just came to a point to where um, we, we had to do something to uh, to um, like from a from a income standpoint, and uh, I wanted to do something on my own, and and that's just kind of where we set our sights was. Hey, let's get into real estate investing. So, um, as you know, I'm wear a few different hats. I'm 
have the Flip Nerd website and show and all that stuff. And I'm, but I'm also a, a franchisee with Homevestors that we buy ugly houses, folks, and I recruit new franchisees into the system as well and mentor and coach them through a site called UglyOpportunities.com. But uh, that's where I started was with Homevestors that we buy ugly houses, folks. So they actually happen to be based in Dallas, where I was at, and I and I, I kind of say we stumbled upon them. Uh, which sounds crazy given that they're based here and have bought you know over 60,000 houses now. But I just never put two and two together that that was a franchise or a business opportunity. I just um, assumed it was an investor. And, and once I found out that it was actually a franchise system and uh, looked into it a little bit more, it was just you know almost immediately the right fit for us. Wow, cool. So uh, you've done mostly, would you say mostly rehabbing or or like a pretty even mix of rehabbing, wholesaling? Yeah, so we've we've bought uh, probably a little over 300 houses, and um, like I said, it was much more in the early years. We don't do quite as much volume directly now, but we do it indirectly in a number of other ways. And so, I've if I had to guess, I don't, I, I should, I should probably know this, but um, if it was 300 houses, we have about 40 rentals, so 260 uh, left, and I I bet we've rehabbed uh, probably 60 to 70 percent. And the rest were wholesale, so probably wholesaled nearly a hundred, and then rehabbed nearly two hundred. All right, and so doing the the rehabbing, and even when you do the wholesaling, you you have to be able to determine repair cost um, to be able to figure out how much you can offer for the house, how much profit you're going to make, yeah, and and all that kind of stuff. I wanted to spend a lot of time getting into. Um, how to determine repair cost. And I think we can probably, if we've got some time, to go into managing contractors and all that kind of stuff. But um, let's start with, you know, how to walk through and, and learn how how to repair, uh, determine repair costs, accurate repair costs uh, for these fix-ups. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a, it's a thing that a lot of real estate investors, especially newer folks, just um, they – they miss a lot of stuff. And uh, so you want to be thorough, but thorough doesn't necessarily mean to be complicated. So I think, um, you know, there are some folks out there, I'm not trying to say anything you know, negative about anybody's uh, technique because uh, I'm not saying that this is exactly how to do it either, but it's just how I do it. Um, is um, There's a lot of things that are easy to miss. And uh, I think you just ha- have to be careful with people uh, even if you if you're hearing this and this is something you do of just saying, well, I estimate twelve dollars a square foot for for rehab, and um, I think people want to try to make this as simple as possible. But especially if, even if you're a wholesaler, I mean, your ultimate customer is a rehabber, is somebody that's going to have to bear those expenses, and so it's really important that you know how to estimate those expenses because um, if you're not accurate in it, then that person's not going to buy from you again, or and this is how I am. You're probably the same way, Danny. You're on a bunch of mailing lists for wholesalers, and you just start to associate their name or the name of their company with BS. You know, I mean, you don't want to be on that list, and most are. So, um, so just don't don't be that guy or that gal. But um, I would say the interesting thing about estimating houses is that truly most stuff actually can be estimated based on square footage. Uh, you can even estimate. This is a little bit rough, but you can even estimate a, a roof uh, based on square footage of the house. Um, you kind of reverse engineer that and be pretty close. And so stuff like HVAC, you know, the HVAC, if it, it either needs it or it doesn't, and if it does, a uh, replacement, let's say, then you, you can just kind of use big buckets of saying, hey, uh, based on the square footage, um, it needs kind of small, medium, or large, you know, equipment, if you will. And you may just know, hey, it's either going to be these are real rough numbers, but it might be like 4,000, 5,000, or 6,500, or something like that. So it's just, those are just kind of like checking a box. It, it actually needs this or it doesn't. And based off the square footage, the size of the equipment is going to vary. Um, carpet and flooring, and you know. Yeah, you so, can, what do you typically estimate for things like carpet? Yeah, so carpet. So we we actually itemize it. So I don't really say, hey, it's twelve, you know, twelve or fifteen or twenty dollars a square foot for a rehab. So for flooring, um, we usually go in around two fifty a foot. Now that's a blend between carpet that might be a, a buck sixty or so a square foot, mm-hmm. and tile that might end up being in the three fifty to four dollar range with uh, labor and materials. And so if you if you were going to tile an entire house, for example, you probably would want to estimate a little bit more. But 
if it's kind of a 30 70 mix or 80 20 mix they're about where it's mostly carpet you know throughout and then the wet areas are tiled then we tend to use around 250 right so um, so what you're saying then is and i agree with that i think that that matches up pretty closely to how i estimate it but so let's say like a thousand square foot house uh, typically you're going to have the the living areas bedrooms hallways uh, carpeted and then you have the kitchen bathrooms tiled maybe the entryway tiled and so if you just say two dollars and fifty cents a yep. square foot would be two thousand five hundred dollars is what you would estimate for the floor yep. for that house yep yes right. and we do the same thing kind of for texture does the house need to be retextured if so it's a dollar ish a square foot um, if you have to scrape texture if you have to re- you know if you have to like repair then that's going to cost something as well if you have to peel wallpaper then uh, you know, you're going to have to retexture under there. That's, that's actually, uh, I'll kind of come back to that because that's one of those things that people tend to kind of miss. Yeah. And so uh, but, when you were, you were saying texture, like that's something on the walls, but you're, you're right. talking about square footage, not of the wall space of the floor space of the house. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. So yeah, dollar foot for uh, texture, but different if you've got more involved, like scraping off old thick texture or something. Yeah. So you've got a, yeah, if you've, if you've got a, if you've got popcorn ceilings and you're going to scrape it, you know, you've got to account for that. And um, as you know, that could either be fairly easy or like really hard. It depends on yeah. what, it depends on what it's, what's it's, been painted over it before. Right. Yeah, and how easy it comes off. Right. Yeah. So sometimes it's just pretty dry. It's still flat paint, and and it comes off. And if they've like painted over it with you know a certain kind of paint or any sort of gloss or anything, then it could be like cement almost. You know, it's just terrible. But. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think there's a number of those things. You know, I would say kind of the big things like roof. Um, HVAC, but, but water heater type situation. You can kind of, those are just like big buckets that you can say, hey, a lot of the stuff I do is based on square footage and the rest of it is, you know, these five or six things, HVAC, does it need a water heater, does it need a roof, does it need new windows? And you can kind of, you know, estimate those at a, at a higher level as well. And what do you typically estimate for like roof per square? And a square for people I don't know is the 10 foot by 10 foot, so 100 square feet. Well... I mean, do you have a rough estimate for you're that? You're catching or? me on a catching <laughs> yeah. me on a day when I don't have, I don't have this off the top of my head right. because uh, I tend to do more. My contractor lately has been more of like turnkey for the whole thing, but I want to say, gosh, I feel like I'm going to be off a little bit, but maybe around one one fifty one sixty a square. Does that sound yeah. about right? Yeah, that's that's about what. Yeah, and yeah. and and in fairness to you, like I don't really typically get up there and measure how many squares. No, like a typical <laughs> size of a house. Like if it's a fifteen hundred square foot house. You know, I'm probably going to pay about thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, for a twenty year, well, actually, I don't know that they even have twenty year anymore, right? They probably year? do, but yeah, we tend to do like a thirty year dimensional type roof, and we don't usually use three tab. I mean, the only time we use three tab is if it's on a rental property and everything else in the neighborhood is also a three tab. Then we might do that, but it doesn't really save a lot of money. I mean, you know, the the biggest part of the expense is is really the labor, so um, it's not necessarily any easier any cost on any cost savings on labor to use a cheaper material that's actually an important tip for rental properties too is like sometimes people say i'm going to just put cheaper stuff in but but i know for a fact in a lot of our rentals we actually put more expensive materials in there um Hmm. because it just you know uh it's not always but in some in some instances especially with like plumbing valves and stuff like that it's like and the the cost of having to come back and redo that again or maintain it could be so much higher if you just if you use cheap materials. So yeah, I'm so amazed that when people scrimp on rental properties for shower surrounds, you know they put that stuff that's it was like a thin plastic right. stuff that you basically glue to the wall, and and inevitably within a couple of months it's leaking, water's getting behind it, it's rotting out your walls, your floors, everything, all because you tried to save a buck on the surround of the showers. It's crazy. Right. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but I would say. Um, it's this is going to sound easier said than done. I'm trying to be like too academic, but I think as a rehabber, it's important to overestimate some of those things um, and uh, be a little have a little bit of cushion there. Now, where it gets tricky is if you are a wholesaler, you know you you want to maximize your profit, so you don't. I will tell you early on, there are times when I wholesale properties, and I would say, you know, for example, hey, the rehab's going to be twenty two thousand. And then somebody would come back and be like, man, I got that done for like 12. I got it done for a lot yeah. less than you thought. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I'd, well, I just, I guess I left 10 grand on the table. Um, so there's well, a balance pay there. attention. Yeah, they'll probably pay attention to every single thing that you sent to them after that for sure, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's kind mm-hmm. of, the, the, you know, 
I guess in the, in my early days, which was uh, 2008, 2009, um, people tended to, I see this kind of a uh, trend across the board. They tended to be a little more detailed and what the, what the house needed. And now people are tend to be more like, ah, we estimate it's about this, but you just need to do your own homework. So people are tend to like provide less information just because mm -hmm. I guess one, it could be a liability issue of like you said something doesn't need to work and, and it does. But, uh, but anyway, we tend to, uh, you just want, you want to be conservative enough to where you don't, you, you know, you, you, comfortably know where you roughly where you're going to end up from a profit standpoint yeah and typically um, what i what i do typically is if if i'm going through and if it needs a whole lot of repairs i'll add a fudge factor of even like two to three thousand dollars maybe more sometimes yeah and if it doesn't need a whole lot i might add just to like a thousand or something just in case something's uncovered that's got to be replaced but can we let's let's go into some of the key places where people uh, maybe have trouble determining what the repair cost is, is should be for for certain general things. So if we go into the kitchen, yeah. what are the kinds of things in the kitchen that you're looking at, and any sort of rough and uh, and as always for everybody listening to this, like everything we're talking about is rough uh, cost rules of thumb, and you should definitely check in your local area to see if that sort of thing relates. But uh, do you want to just like act like we're walking through one of these rehabs, going into the kitchen? And we've sure. got to do everything. We've got to gut it out. Uh, what are we looking at with that? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, uh, so we we almost always use granite on pretty much on everything now. Um, and uh, we get some pretty good pricing there. But we just, like, I, I never, I, I would say that I generally, I'm kind of eyeballing the countertops. I don't really get out my tape measure and get a fine tooth, you know, uh, get my quill out and, like, start uh, calculating what it's going to cost. But I... I just I try to just throw numbers at things to say ah that just and some of it is uh sure, surely comes from doing you know so many rehabs but I usually you know let's just say like within two hundred dollar type buckets I may say that looks like about a sixteen hundred dollar counter to me and that's what I estimated and so um, but some of the things that uh, that people tend to overlook in my experience it's real easy to do I did it a lot early on is uh, in rehabbing there's just this domino effect of if I touch that, then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. So, mm -hmm. in a in a in a kitchen, let's say an example would be, um, if I want to replace the counters, I'm gonna jack up all the backsplash for sure. You know, that's that's sounds probably sounds intuitive when I say that, but sometimes people don't estimate the damage to the wall that's gonna happen, and then and then if you and if, uh, it's kind of like a pool, to, like two tile in a pool is if you think you're going to save it and you don't estimate it and then one little tile gets cracked somewhere you have nothing to match it to so you got to do the whole mm -hmm. thing and so there's <laughs> you know there's a lot of things like that that are just kind of the domino effect but um i would say um you know kitchens are actually pretty straightforward you're either going to replace the cabinets or you're not um replace the hardware or you're not replace the countertops or you're not if you're replacing the cabinets then surely you're replacing the countertops and then you're also going to have to replace the backsplash and you're gonna probably have to do some patchwork to the drywall because you're gonna damage that whole, everything in the whole process. And um, but aside from that, it's you know it's tile on the floor and whatever you're doing with paint and texture and uh, lighting fixtures. But pretty pretty straightforward for the most part. It's interesting. I, I know a lot of people get kind of crazy and move walls and stuff. And we've done very very little of that. We try to avoid that stuff um, as much as possible, and we try to avoid changing layouts. I mean, it's actually pretty rare that we do. Um, and it's, it's interesting. It's not that I don't want to, it's not that I, that's not how I would do it if it was my house. But when you just start to think about your competition of if somebody wants to buy in this neighborhood, this is how all the houses are. And let's just make it, you know, material wise and finish wise as nice as possible. But they just accept the fact that kitchens are smaller here because that's just, that's who I'm competing against. Right. And so I think people tend to get carried away with, you know, how to make it look like something that's going to be in better homes and gardens and, you're surely going to lose money on it if that's what you do. Right. Yeah, I know it's important to to figure out what level uh, of a rehab you need, and that's how you do that is looking at what houses you're competing against, other houses that are for sale in the area, so that, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of, of a potential buyer, you know, you walk in, through the other houses that are for sale in that area. So you're going to see what they get to see and then what you need to make yours look like to be better than theirs so that your sales before theirs does. That's right. Yeah, it's it was in my experience over the years it's been very common for us to 
you know, but at the time we buy a house, the house across the street has a sign in the yard for sale. And by the time we totally rehab it, put it on the market, we'll sell before they do. Um, because for us, it's a business, you know, as a owner occupant, people tend to think of, um, well, you know, they think it's worth more cause they, they have all these memories or they, with their own blood, sweat and tears did something in the house that, you know, if I were, if, if I was looking at it, I'd be thinking if I buy this house, I'm going to rip that right back out. Like I'm, I know you, you love it, but I don't. Right. So, uh, a lot of owner occupants that are selling their home tend to overprice it or they tend to underestimate how dated some things are or whatever. And when they're up against us that are constantly, the name of our game is build a better mousetrap. You just can't compete usually. Yeah. 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 And especially with this market right now, things are flying off the, the market pretty quick in most places, but yeah. back to the, back to the kitchen. Though, I just want to stay on this just a little bit more as far as, you know, a rough, you know, for, for cabinets, honestly, we hardly ever replace cabinets. I mean, if they're good shape, we paint them. Yeah. Uh, do you do the same thing? Yeah, we try to not replace them. I mean, I'd say when we go, if, if, if you're doing like a higher dollar house where more custom stuff, where, where there's, again, looking at your competition, if you're in a older part of town, but there's some major renovations going on and major updates, then we'll consider putting in new cabinets or custom cabinets or uh, even if it's a lower end house and they're really ratty, then sometimes we just put kind of entry level cabinets um you have rough in. rough cost estimate for something like that you know it's um maybe two two hundred dollars like a linear foot of something like that something. yeah about that much yeah and uh you know we were fortunate a long time ago to find a local cabinet maker that um makes kind of the same quality level you would get at a home depot um, but, uh, probably a little bit, maybe even a little bit higher quality, but they're, but they're a custom fit cause he's making them from scratch. So, mm -hmm. so if you buy off the shelf, you know, they have a couple of, a couple of different options for each like sink base and overhead cabinets. And there's only a couple of options and what you end up doing, especially in a smaller, older style home is putting in a bunch of blank spaces to just like fill the gaps of, you know, they didn't have a cabinet big enough. So I'm going to put a blank in here. Yeah, right. And so with the custom ones, we're able to really put some fairly inexpensive, uh, cabinets in, but they're, they look nice and new. We tend to like, you know, stain them a dark color and put a little crown molding on them. So they look real custom, but they're not necessarily expensive, but, but yeah, I would agree with you. We, we would try to avoid that at all costs, um, unless our competition is forcing us to do it. Right. So if you have to put those custom ones in, you know, for a, a standard sort of smaller kitchen with maybe eight, eight feet of, of countertop space, you know, having uppers and lowers for both. Do you have yeah. like a rough idea of what the total cost is? You know, just real rough number. If you're talking about kind of entry level cabinets, by the time you, uh, you, if you have to have them transported there, installed, you know, all that stuff, you're probably in the three thousand dollar range for kind of entry level cabinets. By the time you get them stained and finished, um, and, then, and we've and spent maybe. many times that for custom cabinets in a higher end house. So you can you could basically spend as much as you want to. Uh, yeah. on custom stuff for sure. Yeah, the high-end kitchens, you can really lose your, your lunch pretty quick yep. with the cost of doing some of those. Um, the, the What about laminate countertops, like the stuff from Home Depot? Like an eight-foot length is usually, what, like $120, $130? Yeah, I don't, uh, We and we very rarely, we very rarely use that ourselves. Um, sometimes, probably on rental properties, we have... Um, but there's actually That's some, right. you know, and, and the market is different now that, you know, eight years ago it was, um, I guess granted has become so prevalent and so inexpensive that it's, it's a little bit hard to compete. And it goes back to the labor there is, um, if I have to have my GC cutting laminate and s putting end caps on it and all that stuff, um, it, it starts to become kind of less competitive with granted, even if it's just a little bit more expensive. Um, but I will say, for the, early on, there were a number of times in the past where we had a kind of a specialty paint guy come in and paint like an epoxy mm -hmm. on countertops. That if, especially, we kind of did this on some lower end houses, so it wasn't um, something that we did widespread. But uh, this epoxy, have you ever used this? It's kind of like oh, yeah. it's like a three part epoxy. So pretty pretty powerful stuff in terms of um, durability. And if you get those cat those counters that are like. Um, in great shape they're just 50 years old and pea green you know but 
You right. can paint it with kind of a fleck that makes it look a little granity or look like look like stone at least, and it's clearly not. But um, it's actually pretty impressive what you can do with some of those uh, specialty yeah. paints. You can get that done for like 150 bucks too. And then especially whenever we encounter uh, countertops that sort of custom, you know, they're laminate, but they're custom. And so it would cost a lot more to replace them because we'd have to special order or do granite or something like that. And so painting them, you know, as long as they're not peeling up or anything uh, with the epoxy. Yeah, and again, it, the, even if they're in good shape, just to take them out, it costs you money to take them out. Then you're going to screw yeah. up the backsplash and then all the kind of domino effect stuff we talked about. So, you know, painting them in the past, uh, especially on lower end houses, has been um, a pretty cost effective uh, solution. Right. For the granite countertops uh, that, you know, you say you mostly do that. Do you guys hunt for like remnant deals or what do you do for granite? We use, uh, I've used almost the same color on every house and we just tend to use the same supplier. I mean, he's like 26 bucks a foot. Pretty cost okay. effective, installed, um, and so um, we've tended to just uh, text this guy, and he'll look at it the next day, and we say, "Can you put it in the next day?" And it's just kind of done. Wow, that's but uh, but yeah, we we tended to use uh, probably a color that a lot of people that use granite will uh, find familiar, but uh, new Venetian gold is kind of one that we've used oh, for yeah. many years. Right, and so for what else in the kitchen? So do you guys put appliances? In the house, yeah. is that your Yeah, your maybe not a refrigerator, but yeah, we, we usually use, uh, for the past several years, it's usually kind of a, a fairly entry-level stainless uh, package. And if it's um, if it's electric, we tend to use like a smooth top type stove just because it's a clean look and everything. And um, But yeah, even with appliances, I'd say we tend to have kind of packages. We'd say, hey, if it's, a, if it's like a basic house or um, not even necessarily entry-level, but up to you know, 150,000, which depending on where you're listening at, if you heard a $150,000 house in California, it's a little bit different in Texas. <laughs> but, um, you know, for kind of a, around the median price point in our market or below, we would use um, a stainless type package and it'll end up being around 1800 bucks by the time you have a stove, dishwasher, and probably a microwave with a, with a Vena hood under it. And um, and delivered and everything, so that's that's about that package. And and if you went to a, to a higher end house and we did something that has a cooktop or a little bit higher end, um, like if it's gas or something like that, then we might be looking at twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars. I mean, you, again, you could spend as much as you want there too. But I would say most of the things we do, we've always kind of had like an A package and a B package. Of most of our houses, we're going to use the A package, which is you know, all the same materials that we use over and over and over again. And if it's a little bit higher end house in our markets, if it's in the kind of 180 to 200,000 plus, then we probably make some decisions like, hey, instead of using satin nickel, we're going to use oil rub bronze, which the costs are really the same these days. So we've tended to use a ORB a lot more. And then we'll step things up like instead of using ceramic tile, we might use travertine, we might use a little bit of engineered hardwood um, and a few things like that that are just more of like finishing type things. Mm -hmm. But uh, other than that, I would say one of the big tips I would give is just find kind of a, a, a level of material that you use the same thing over and over and over again. If, if we rehab nearly 200 houses, we've used the same interior paint on almost all of them but a couple when we tried to get creative and then regretted it. And so um, <laughs> it's just a lot easier. Are you doing like big murals, like, you know, like a wolf howling at the moon or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we're like, oh, it's a higher end house. We're going to like, you know – you change the colors from the bedroom, one bedroom to the next, and the kitchen's going to be a different color. And then and it's, it's a nightmare. you got to touch up paint, and you're like, well, I don't have any more of this one. And what color was that again? I don't even remember. So, Well, with, you know. with, with paint, with regards to paint, do you have any sort of rules of thumb for uh, determining paint cost uh, for interior, exterior type of? Well, um, so my uh, our, my contractor has tended to be around a dollar to a dollar ten uh, a foot, a square foot of the house. This is for interior paint. Uh, not including texture, um, and uh, so it tends. So if it's a, if it's a eighteen hundred square foot house, he's probably estimating around eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars to paint the interior, and that's all one color other than tr you know trim, uh, which we just we just usually use like a bright white for trim and doors, and we use kind of an off white for uh, everything else, and uh, uh, you know just to try to keep it neutral. But but yeah, it's tended to be in that price range. The outside. Um, I don't know if we really kind of doesn't really kind of he probably estimates that a little bit less based off of the interior square footage, but it ends up being around a dollar to a dollar ten a square foot of the 
interior square footage as well. And that's if it doesn't need a you know a bunch of trim repair and right. uh, woodwork and stuff like that. Of course, all that stuff you know adds up quickly too. Right. Do you guys typically replace windows? Like, if you come across a house that has single pane windows, or does that determined by what the competition is? Yeah, you're right. So that's what we would do. Is if if we if it looks like a lot of the houses that have sold recently have replaced the windows and had double pane windows. I mean, I like them. I I wouldn't want to in my home to have old single pane windows, but um, if that's what is all recently sold and the budget's real tight, then uh, we usually just kind of leave it there. I, mm-hmm. I know that this I, I know this is this could come off as wrong. It's going to sound bad, but on lower end houses. Um, the average buyer probably cares less about the efficiency of the windows than having granite in the kitchen, for example. So if we had an extra thousand bucks to spend on something, we would probably do it on something more like granite or oil rub bronze fixtures or something than the windows, um, unless a lot of the competition was replacing the windows. So I like to replace the windows. I, I like to make houses look like a new house, but you've really got to, it's not about, it's about trying to, estimate what that buyer who the buyer of your house is going to be and what their expectations are more so than it is you being proud of absolutely the before right. and after pictures that you can put in a photo album somewhere right but with that yeah, said, we always try to we always they're always nice houses i mean for sure but it's just a matter of you know we're not putting travertine in a ninety thousand dollar house because we won't get the value back out of it and people won't even see the value in it right yeah, well, you know, one of the biggest difference that I've noticed that doesn't cost very much at all is changing out plugs and switches. Yeah. You know, just changing, like you paint everything. It's funny because you might not even think about it until you paint everything and then you look and like something still looks wrong and it's because you've got the old dingy. Yeah. And you can't just change the plates most of the time because the plug itself is painted over or something else. That's right. Yeah, we, we tend to replace plugs and switches in almost every house for that same reason. You get a nice fresh coat of paint on everything and then you've got these kind of yellowed looking Yeah. Uh, outlets and of course if you put a white plate on a yellow looking outlet it looks like crap so right and it's like what 200 250 bucks throughout the yeah house not much change. like three you know three or four dollars yeah. a, a plug or a switch or something yeah. so install and then, yeah. for windows if you do replace them do you typically use the the um, double pane to like the vinyl yeah low e windows yeah and it's it's just a matter of over time having you know contractors that um we just say Hey, the same ones you used on the last one, do that again. Mm-hmm. Do that again. And we never we don't have to like go out and rethink, well, what other types of windows do you have? It's like I mean, just use the ones we've done on the last, you know, 30 houses that you've that you've worked on. We just want to use those again. Unless they say, Hey, we've got something equivalent to that, but it's even a better price or right. or uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but it has this awesome feature or whatever. We're always open to hearing things, but I don't want to have to go meet with my window guy and look at the window and all that stuff. I just want to know that I'm working with somebody that I trust and take their judgment and look at the cost and say, go. Yeah. Do you have a typical uh, idea of a rough idea for a cost for replacing one? Um, you know, I know they all come in different shapes and sizes, but typically yeah. houses have this sort of the Yeah. We, size. we tend to kind of estimate in the two two fifty a, a, a whole type thing, but you know, um, we also tend to estimate kind of small, medium, large. So it might be, you know, 200, 250, 300, um, based on the size of the windows. Or sometimes if you're estimating and there's like a, if there was like a, a large window in the front of the house, we might say, Hey, that's 250 times three. Cause you know, um, I, here's what I would say is I think people tend to get up, get hung up on, well, there's this weird kind of siding thing in the back. I think we need to replace a bunch of the siding. And how do I estimate that? It's like, what I've tended to do is say, I don't know what that costs, but I'm going to say, let's just throw $1,000 at it or $1,500 or whatever the number might be, and I know that's going to get it done. And that's my estimate because right. otherwise, right. I, that way I can make an estimate, um, fairly educated estimate, but I can make an estimate in 10 seconds versus could be days of like trying to get people to come out and look at it and stuff like yeah, that. Absolutely. And by then you might lose the deal or you're going to lose the deal, you know? Right, err on the side of conservative and just move on. Like yeah, get so, yourself a yeah. So stuff like carpet, stuff like that. Like I said, it's easy to estimate by square foot. And then there's the other stuff. It's like soffit repair or some something weird that's unique to that house, or removing this old ratty shed in the back, or whatever it is. It's like I don't know what that's going to cost, but I'm going to throw a few chunks of five hundred dollars at it and say that's going to yeah. be five hundred dollars. That's going to be two thousand dollars. I don't know what it is, but I know that's going to get it done. 
And that's just kind of how I estimate that stuff. Yeah. And one, one other thing too, is if it's something that you're, you're really not sure of to maybe consider what the, the material cost would be of whatever it is, you know, just like a rough idea or a guess of, of what it is and then determine how long you think it would take for somebody to do it and then put a dollar value of maybe $25 an hour or something. And then you can come up with sort of a rough guesstimate. And then if it's a big job or something you think that might take a couple of days, then maybe add a little bit of a fudge factor. But, you know, none of this stuff is going to be exact. You could go in there and know everything uh, to repair down to a science and measure everything down to an inch or something and calculate a repair cost and then do the rehab and find out that you weren't even close. Yeah, you'd still like miss you'd, you'd still miss stuff. So I, if you if you're a little conservative on a lot of the stuff that you estimate, then you know there's going to be some stuff that you didn't expect at all. But hopefully that kind of bad news is offset by some good news somewhere else. Right. All right. Let's move. I think uh, one of the rooms that is important that we haven't touched yet is a bathroom. So if you go into a bathroom, and um, let's say you know we got to replace the tub and do something with the uh, tubs around and a vanity, which is typical, and the toilet and the mirror. Uh, what kind of cost are you typically looking at? And, and again, let's let's look at like the typical median home priced home. It's not an expensive home. It's not a super cheap rental. Um, yeah. What would you say to something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, some of the same things that you we talked about in the kitchen. Is um, a, t- a bathtub by itself is not that expensive, but the labor to tear it out and the damage you do tearing it out and putting it back in is where the real money is. So, um, but with that said. You know, there aren't very many houses that we bought that we didn't have to replace the tub. I mean, probably, you know, 75, 80 percent of the time we're replacing tubs and shower fixtures. And a lot of types of houses that we buy, you know, they, they're they like uh, have a lot of deferred maintenance. So they could be anywhere from like horrid to, yeah, we just need to replace it. So even like the tile, though, when you say, um, you know, it doesn't look too bad, but it's pink or it's, you know, it's some mm-hmm. outdated color. It's like I'm gonna have to tear. I'm gonna have to tear it off. In the process, we're gonna basically just destroy the wall because that's just that's just what's okay. gonna happen. And therefore, and, and by the time I've got the wall all torn up, you know, probably while those guys are in there with hammers tearing out the tile, even if you thought the tub was in good shape and didn't need to be replaced, well, how many of those tiles are gonna land on their corner right on the tub? <laughs> Next thing you know, you know, you didn't replace the tub, and they're in there doing a final cleaning, and there's all these chips in the tub because somebody didn't estimate that somebody was in there and accidentally dropped their hammer or something else, you know? Right. So we would just tend to just, just gut it and, and, uh, and kind of go back in with, with a new tub. And, um, but, uh, you know, we, we always tile the surrounds. We never put plastic surrounds in or anything like that. I mean, it's that, I don't think, I don't know if that's even any cheaper, <laughs> but, um, you know, toilets are cheap and flooring is, is cheap. And it's so like, so like a, a vanity. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. I didn't want to cut you off. say like a vanity, it's going to be the same thing with like the kitchen cabinets. We're going to try to not have to replace it. So mm-hmm. a much more common scenario for us is just to replace the top, which is you know, usually like cultured marble. And we would have somebody come out and measure. We have just a, a cultured marble company that would come out and measure two baths or um, sometimes there's like a little dressing table or something, whatever needs that cultured marble. We would just have them come out and measure replacing the tops, which are kind of the sink and the top included and pretty cost effective. Um, and so that's one of those ways that you can kind of get by with maybe an older looking cabinet that you paint and uh, put some nice hardware on it or something. And then it has a brand new top. So that just kind of helps it look like it's, you know, uh, pretty new for the most part. Right. What's an idea for a cost of one of those tops for just the typical sort of single vanity? Uh, um, Man, I should have looked at my numbers before we had this uh, show today. <laughs> I'm but sorry. We I did. bet you, you know, somewhere in the in the hundred dollar range, maybe, maybe give or take. It, it kind of depends on how many of them you're doing, because mm-hmm. you know, it's it's like if you're doing three, then the cost is not dramatically more because you don't have the tr- you know you don't have a lot more for the trip charge and the installation charge and stuff like that. But just a regular kind of sink, I would say, uh, like thirty inch wide or something like that. You're, probably in the 90 to 120 range by the time you they come out measure it make it custom make it come back and install it and all that right and then the vanity if you like go to home depot or lowe's and get something that's decent yeah probably looking at 200 to 300 for the vanity with the top and sink right and then install is probably what like another 7500 bucks maybe something like that yeah 
Yeah. So then you could easily get up to 300 to $400. So if by just replacing the top, painting it, putting hardware, you're cutting the cost in half. Yeah. And for mirrors, we've tended to go to like a Hobby Lobby type place or like a home... Uh, um, yeah, home decor kind of school. Home decor type place or whatever and just get like framed mirrors that are pre-framed and get something that looks nice. Um, it's always a challenge because a lot of those stores don't have a ton of inventory, so you, you never know what you're going to get when you go there. But um, that's been one of those things that's been historically hard to out. I mean, my contractor's done a pretty good job, but there were early on for a long time, it was like I would find myself, even though I don't, don't tend to do a lot of the work, picking that stuff out because it was so so hit or miss when you go to look that it was like, I don't want my contractor picking out something that just doesn't look like it fits at all. Right. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, that's what we've tended to do. And if it's a lower end house, we might use the flat mirrors with like the little plus plastic, uh, holders and stuff. And I, I don't, I don't really like those, but, um, yeah, the frame mirrors, I think you can get typically a good size one for like 69 bucks or something. Yeah, and it not, looks great, you know? Yeah. They're not that expensive. It's just the, uh, the finding them and, you know, if you need two of them, finding two that match or whatever it might be, or two that at least kind of go together, but. And then a toilet uh, to buy and install is, you know, what's a rough idea on that? Materials wise, you're probably, you know, for um, a little bit above entry level, you're kind of 100 to 120 range for materials and installs, probably about that as well. All right, I would agree with that. And then a new tub. Uh, well, we talked about that about, well, no, we didn't talk about the price. I think new tubs, probably like $150 for the tub at most. And then maybe another 150 to install. So that's about 300. Would you agree with that? That sounds about right. Of course you got the backs, uh, the, uh, surround, the tile surround and all that stuff. I will say in some of the, some of, uh, why I'm, uh, don't have like great numbers to, to give you off the bat is I, I tend to look at the project more in totality. I mean, we, we kind of roll it up with all those individual things. Um, but, um, when my contractor, I, and I use a general contractor that pretty much, uh, does everything except for, um, my guy doesn't do, uh, roofing, he doesn't do HVAC, he does light electrical and does most of the plumbing and then everything else, all the finish out and landscaping and stuff like that. So, um, but you know, we would tend to kind of roll it up and then in my mind, it's like, I just, I, I, Hey, I need to be at like 22,000 or less and then he'll give me an estimate. And, and if it's, and again, I worked with the same guy for almost every house I've ever rehab. So we have a really good relationship, um, in that regard. But if it was in the ballpark of that, then I don't usually get in, dive into the details of right, yeah. what the individual costs are. Although he estimates it that way too, but I tend to just like look at the bottom and see what's the number. <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, I think uh, so. With with all that said, I think an important thing to consider is to you get some scale that way. So if you if you can find a contractor that can, because a lot of contractors like so, somebody asked me the other day, hey, I need somebody to uh, come over and like reglaze the tile in my shower. Like, who could I use for that? And I was like, well, I know a bunch of people, but nobody wants to do that. I mean, they they want to go rehab right. a house. They don't want to spend more time coming to your house and talking about it than it's actually going to do to to do the work. You know. A lot of my contractors just want, they want big jobs, not like little handyman type things. So um, if you can find that person, then you get some scale because they know, hey, in three weeks, I'm going to get this much income and I pay my guys this much per hour. And therefore, I estimate that I'm going to pocket this much money when it's all said and done. Um, you can get a lot more scale than, you know, having somebody come over to hang one ceiling fan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so find somebody that can handle uh, doing most of the work. You still have your specialty people, like your HVAC, your electric, right? Uh, plumbing, uh, roof. But for the most part, you've got one guy that's managing, doing everything else. Right. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the way to go because you don't want to be sitting there having to schedule everybody, having people walk over each other, and and running into all the scheduling problems because it becomes a, a real nightmare absolutely. trying to juggle all of that. But Man, we've already burned up uh, 45 minutes. I wanted to get into a lot huh. of other stuff, but I think um, we got into a lot of great details. And, no, I agree with you, Mike. It, it's pretty hard to, I mean, especially because I didn't say, you know, this is what we're going to cover exactly, prepare for it. You know, we just got in here and started talking about it. Uh, I'm going to include, I've got a, a, a worksheet somewhere, I think, or a, a quick little list of 
rough rules of thumb for some of these major costs. I can include that on show notes page. Oh, great. Um, hey, one other thing, if I could give a quick tip to people, because I think um, um, I, sometimes when I talk to people, they're like, well, yeah, you you have those contractors because, I mean, at our peak, when we were doing a lot of houses, we were rehabbing five to seven houses at any given time. So we were able to keep a lot of kind of crews busy and stuff like that. And that's true. If you are rehabbing a house every other month, you won't have that same um, uh, kind of um, I don't even know what the word is for that, but basically you won't have uh, their contractors. Um, you, you're not, you're not as important to them and they're not as important to you. Well, they, I guess they're still pretty important to you, but you're not as important to them. Um, if uh, you're just doing some things here and there. So one thing I would encourage you to do is just try to, this is going to sound kind of crazy, but almost like form a co-op. Like if you have some other investors that you know in town, that you can refer contractors to each other and those contractors kind of start to get that, hey, I work for this small group of guys or gals or whatever it might be um, that that know that collectively you're uh, they're serving kind of you as a group and you start to, you know, they, they don't want to screw any one of you because then effectively they've screwed you all. So, I mean, co-op is, is too structured of a, of a word um, or an idea, but something like that where you kind of have a little bit of a consortium that uses the same type of contractors and, and they kind of know that you're all together. Right. Now that's an awesome idea. And, and a place that you can maybe uh, create something like that is if you go to your local uh, real estate investor association meeting. Sure. Yeah. Uh, usually once a month and then maybe find some people that are doing a rehab here and there that maybe have a good contractor. And then you could even get, you know, find out who the contractors are and talk with them, find out who you like, who you trust, and then who could maybe give you some help determining repair cost. Also. Yeah, even at, at Rio Clubs, even if you um, if you find your contractors there, if they're vendors for that group, or a lot of clubs have um, you know, different vendors or sponsors, then they probably will be more loyal to you because they're loyal to that group. And if you're a part of that group, then it's it's kind of a little bit of a co-op as well. They don't want to disappoint you. They're less likely to treat you wrong because they, they care more about their brand and that word of mouth will get back around. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, Mike. Well, this has been a, a information-packed episode. I'm sure everybody's enjoying all the information that you've shared. And um, is there a, a book that you've been reading that you would recommend to the audience? Uh, you know, I have. Uh, I've been reading some books on marketing, so I don't know if that's going to help anybody. Okay, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I don't know if that's a, if that's the best fit. Um, but uh, I, what I would encourage people to do is. Uh, this is going to sound like a, a public 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 service announcement of some sort. Is just to always educate yourself. I think it's important in this industry to learn and uh, always be. Re- There's not a lot of books out on real estate investing other than you know obviously Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad Poor Dad. A lot of those things are are out there. But I think um, I would say most people that are real estate investors are um, in their nature they're an entrepreneur. They're looking to build something. Real estate might be the path that you've chosen, but um, Real estate tends to just be the vehicle more so than I do this because I really love real estate. It's kind of what it does for you if you do it right that you care more about. So I, I think it's important to kind of stay sharp and stay educated in this industry because it tends to be kind of a lonely space. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of people are not, you know, po- podcasts and a lot of things have changed that, but um, have added a lot of access to education and information and, and people that, you know, have a lot of experience that you can learn from more so than in the past. But, um, it, it can get to be a pretty lonely world. So I think it's important to kind of stay on top of market trends and, uh, what's going on out there. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so the audience knows also that you, uh, you run flipnerd.com and you just recently rolled out a really cool update to flip nerd. Do you want to talk to the audience about that real quick? Yeah. So we just, uh, rolled out, I changed literally just rolled it out. So if you're hearing this, uh, you, you may not even know this yet if you are a member of the site, but we have um, added. Uh, so first off, uh, if you're not familiar with the site at all, we we launched about six months ago. We have uh, over 40,000 subscribers so far. And um, it's we have a free membership and we have a, a paid membership. The paid membership is very reasonable per month. But we have effectively created the really the only kind of national um online listing platform for off-market deals. So kind of the MLS, but not listed properties, more of investor type properties. So as we speak right now, we have a little over 800 properties on the site, um, which are mostly wholesale deals all across the country. 
and uh, and dozens more are added every day. And so um, our pro members, our paid member, which is a pretty reasonable price again, actually get real time email. And if they want them, text alerts to a new property listed in your market so you can find out, you know, real time what's going on. But we also have um, uh, a vendor platform where vendors in your market, it's all segmented by market wherever you are in the U.S., uh, can advertise from general contractors to title companies and lenders, electricians, plumbers, on and on. Uh, but some of the stuff that we've just added is uh, forums, something called member journals where it's kind of like a member blog where you can actually – Write if you if you have something great to share, you can teach other people. You could profile a recent rehab project you did, and you can actually add video or before and after pictures or whatever you might want to if you want to kind of express yourself and share some information with others and uh, a number of other things. So I won't drag it out too long, but it's just a fantastic uh, platform. Um, obviously, I'm a little biased, but we think it's a great platform for real estate investors. It's hard to imagine a real estate investor in America wouldn't uh, want to have at least a free membership to get access to all we've got. And then, of course, uh, my show, uh, which um, we actually are about to launch a second podcast as well. But our main podcast, we have done uh, done a little bit over almost 300 uh, expert interviews over the past, uh, kind of a similar format to yours, although mine is a vi- more of a video format, but you can listen to the audio as well. And done almost 300 expert interviews in the past uh, year and a half or so. Awesome. Yeah, everybody should definitely check out flipnerd.com and then Mike's uh, podcast. What's the name of your podcast, Mike? Um, if you, uh, well, you can go to flipnerd.com slash shows to get access to our different shows. Or if you just do a search in iTunes under Flipnerd, you'll see the different options we have available there. But call it the, the main show is the uh, Flipnerd Expert Interview Show. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again, Mike, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Great, Danny. Great to talk to you again. All right. Have a great day. You too, my friend. All right, I hope you really enjoyed the show, and if you want to find out more about flipping houses and getting started in this business, be sure to check out FlippingJunkie.com and uh, go ahead and subscribe and get some great stuff, including my ebook, Flipping Houses Exposed, 34 Weeks in the Life of a Successful House Flipper. And then if you go to the show notes page for today's show at FlippingJunkie.com slash 5, the number 5, FlippingJunkie.com slash 5, uh, you'll be able to uh, find the repair estimates rules of thumb guide that I'm providing. Uh, you can download that for free and check out some of the uh, rules of thumb for determining costs for some repairs for rehabs. Check it out. It's really cool. See you next time.